ways have to struggle with some of these changes going forward. On the other hand, besides those challenges we're faced with opportunities, food security increased through greater efficiency in, in the uh, supply chains. Supermarkets as motors of rice market quality differentiation and labeling. And all of this uh, will increase incentives right up the supply chain to the farmers. Now, I have uh, some open questions that I feel privileged to just throw on the, the table, which are two. I've been thinking, what the heck is the role of policy and private-public partnerships to address these challenges and pursue these opportunities? Is this just a thing that will happen parallel? Or will policy interact with it? Will it make it faster? Will it make it easier? Will it include more people? Will it make it more effective? And the last question I had actually flipped the other way around when I was sitting this morning listening to the plenary and thinking, hey, you know, everybody has in their mind a rice farmer, informal rice farmer, and a big government guy. Okay, that's the way all these debates go. Over and over and over again, like a broken <coughs> record. Okay, and of course, when there's a crisis, it becomes more of a broken record. It spins a little bit faster. But really, these changes I'm talking about are a lot more important over the longer term than some policy debates here and there as you're bumping along. How will these things change the policy debate? How will these actors that are consolidating turn around and say, as they have in the produce sector, they have in the dairy sector, they have in the meat sector, they have in the non-food sector, they turn around and policymakers and they say, hey, make this work, cut down the resistance, cut down the constraints, we need to make this market grow, what are you going to do about that? And there's going to be a heavy pressure in the future that will affect how the policies and how these market structures and regulations develop just in the way that prop science people are doing at present, influencing the regulations and the property rights that envelop the supply chain at the input end. So with that, I conclude. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom, for this excellent presentation. Uh, so we, we concluded all our presentations. Uh, I'm happy to say that actually we have 30 more minutes for panel discussion. And also I'm happy to tell you that uh, we have Dr. Tarhu Pingali who will join us for, for the panel discussion. If you couldn't ask a question to him during the plenary debate, you've got a second chance now. You can definitely direct a question to Prabhu here who, is, who will join us uh, for the discussion. <laughs> I'm sure I would definitely like to hear from the private sector, particularly the rice trading community, about what Tom said uh, regarding, the, regarding rice uh, differentiation or the change in the supply chains. With that, let me open up the floor for the question and answer. And uh, do we have any mics here? Uh, any question from the audience there? Yes, ma'am. Any mic here? Please introduce yourself and uh, tell who you are asking the question. Here, in the front. Probably I am not as good as you in, in moderating the session there. Yes, my name is Delima Darmawan. I'm from the Naima Group of Indonesia. Uh, this is very interesting because of the... Uh, uh, I just uh, get question to uh, Dr. Prabhu Pinyali regarding of the policy about the low price rice, pol rice, low rice price policy versus high price price policy. In a developing country, if we take the policy, usually we take the low price price policy in order to incorporate the what we call it the poverty reduction. Because if we increase the price of rice, then uh, the the poverty people is getting more. That's that. Uh, Yes, uh, this is related to the, the, the open question by uh, Professor Thomas Linden regarding of how, how was the role of the policy with the private-public-private uh, private, uh, private partnership, for example. In Indonesia, case of Indonesia, million smallholders engage in the rice production. Now we are in the dramatic when we want to offer the private sector to incorporate in this business. If we don't open this kind of business to the private sector, maybe we are left behind from other producer countries. 
But in other side, this is dilemmatic also how we incorporate the smallholder in this business. So win-win solution between the private sector and the smallholders. And the second question is regarding of the, the role of the biotechnology. Uh, this is actually this is uh, still also pro cons regarding of because involvement of the multinational corporation in this business. Uh, some of the experts think that biotechnology is just the way a smart uh, uh, smart multifunction company uh, approach to control the rice production of food production in the in the developing country through the the the, the con to control the biotechnology like a seed and fertilizer and. Uh, uh, other agree. So I just take a few regarding of the how we gonna uh, get the mass production of the biotechnology in order to small farmers of, uh, also can incorporate and take the chance to get the uh, uh, not expensive uh, technology. Thank you. Maybe the book you can answer it first, then you come, then you are okay. Awesome. We have three questions for the three candidates. Thank you. Uh, the question on whether the country should pursue a low food price policy or not. Um, I think in the very early stages of development, it probably makes sense to have some kind of food a program to support very poor consumers. Uh, but if you look at Asian economies today, for most of them, having a policy that that's low price policy primarily supporting urban consumers is becoming counterproductive. It's becoming counterproductive because it's the incentives for farm households to increase their productivity is severely being affected by distorted price policies. So I think for a government, you have a choice. You have a choice of putting your money into massive productivity improvement and thereby seeing a long-term <coughs> reduction in prices versus putting that same amount of money into uh, ways in which you subsidize urban uh, consumers without seeing a commensurate improvement in productivity. And I would argue that over the long term, working on the enhancing productivity of smallholder agriculture is a much more viable option than trying to subsidize urban uh, consumers and gain politically from that respect. Thank you, Tom. Yes. Um, just, um, I think that... Sorry, yes. Um, just some points about including small farmers and the very interesting point you made that on one side, if you lag in trying to develop and promote this structural transformation and modernization, then you're foregoing gains from efficiency, obviously. On the other hand, you know, you have the equity trade-off and the issue of including small farmers. I think that what we're seeing is that de facto, and I can talk, talk a little bit about the case of Indonesia, certainly in areas like Bandung, you find that um, larger <coughs> farmers are buying up the rice land of smaller rice farmers and either shifting to horticulture or having larger mm -hmm. rice operations. And um, in many areas, we see this very large, 50% of the land in the rice sample that we did in Heilongjiang in China, central rice producing area, was rental land. And so the rental markets are basically seeing the bigger actors or medium actors pulling land away and renting while a lot of those smaller farmers are going to migration or off-farm activity. And so uh, I think there'll be consolidation of land and land rental that will change the face of things regardless of how policy acts. Secondly, 
We talk about small farms, but I think we need to define small farms, and we can think about it in the Indonesian case, that you, there's small farms and there's small farms. There's small farms that are very involved in the, um, in, let's say, the horticultural supply chains in Indonesia into modern markets, uh, but that have non-land assets that are adequate, irrigation, uh, access to road, extension, warehouses, information, education. These are non-land assets that are useful, that can be used as the base, for example, to adequately associate or aggregate and attain the kinds of economies of scale and quality uh, together that are necessary to be in this kind of changing markets. However, what we found both in rice and in non-rice products the small farmer that's in the hinterland, that's far from the road, that doesn't have the education or extension or irrigation, uh, those are the real excluded ones. And I think will be continue to be excluded and probably will actually have an acceleration. And this is a big debate in India, but do you use fertilizer subsidy that in the states that we've studied, Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh, we found that the huge majority of the subsidized fertilizer being sold to the state retail stores is going to the medium and large farmers, not to the small farmers. And so, do you use that fund for fertilizer subsidy in rice and wheat areas, or do you use it to grow, to improve roads and assets that can serve the smallest farmers? That's a difficult question. And third, um, the small farmers probably should also be moving into horticulture and other things that pay more per hectare. Horticulture pays four, more, four times more than rice. It's crazy for them to stay in rice when they can shift into something that pays a lot more. And last, I think that <laughs> contracts and associations among farmers could be a possible way to go. And in that case, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the way of the future. And often, like in India, for example, regulations really keep companies from entering into contract relations. Lack of intellectual property right, lack of contract enforcement laws and mechanisms mar that and as well as cooperative laws that allow you to form those associations productively for marketing purposes. Those have to be reformed. Those are all regulations that can help. Thank you. First up, I'd like to thank you for your question. And um, so if I have understood correctly, I mean, there were two sides uh, of this question. One, the fear of uh, the multinational company controlling food chain. And the second one is uh, how to make uh, technology available to resourceful farmers. So regarding your, the first question, this fear that a multinational company could be controlling food chain. I, mean, I think that this is definitely a fear and that this is uh, not reality. Uh, I think that there is a misconception between consolidation that happened into the agrochemical agro sector and uh, its power into the, into the food chain. If you look at the food chain, I mean, there is a, a huge amount of stakeholders, starting with uh, the farmer itself, the consumers, the miller in the case of rice, and the food industry, and so on and so forth. Not forgetting the politician and the authority as well. So I don't think that uh, you know, a company like, uh, like in, in my case, by our science, uh, has a, a that much of a power and would be able to control it. We are under the influence of many, many different uh, organizations also, and this is something that we have to deal with. So I think that we are giving us way too much power compared to what we <laughs> truly have. Regarding uh, the introduction of uh, biotechnology, I would like to, uh, to uh, maybe remind you that um, uh, in the case of rice, uh, probably the first biotech products are not going to be introduced by multinational companies. And in the case of uh, the, the probably the, the two first products um, that may be introduced into the marketplace are going to be, on one hand, uh, the Chinese tea rice, and on the other hand, uh, golden rice. <coughs> so you see that um, I mean, the uh, private sector is not the only one who is uh, working on those type of technology. The public sector is also very heavily involved into this because it has been perceived and understood as a technology that is going to help uh, addressing the challenges that we are facing. The second point was re regarding uh, the uh, making this technology available to resourceful farmers. And this is going back to uh, really, uh, the presentation that I have unfolded for you. Uh, technology is 